Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. So in continuation from the last video, we're here to talk about some tips that you can use to improve your sleep. So previously I said that I'd be doing five tips, but I actually had so much that I wanted to talk about that we're gonna go ahead and do 10. So these tips largely derive from Matthew Walker, the author of Why We Sleep. And really the whole point of this is that I realize that not everyone has the buy-in to read a long book or to listen to a two hour podcast. So really I'm just trying to keep these tips short and concise such that you can apply them immediately to help improve your sleep. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Tip number one is regularity. And so generally you want to try to go to bed and wake up at the same time every day. So in our bodies, we have what we call a circadian rhythm, circa meaning around and dian, which is derived from diem meaning day. So around a day or around 24 hours, we have this internal clock that dictates when we're awake and when we're asleep. It dictates a lot of other physiological processes too, but for the sake of this discussion, we will go ahead and just focus on the sleep aspect. So generally we are happier and healthier when we're in sync with our circadian rhythm and going to bed and waking up at the same time every day helps to promote that. So for better sleep, go to bed and wake up at the same time every day. I realize that this is easier said than done, but it gives us a goal to strive for. Tip number two is quantity. And really what we should be aiming for for the overwhelming majority of the population is seven to nine hours. So some may be able to get by on less than seven hours. Some may need more than seven hours, but seven to nine is really that sweet spot for the overwhelming majority of us. Uh, anything less than seven will generally be able to show objective impairment. There is a genetic variation of a sleep related gene that would allow a very, very small portion of the population to get by on less than seven hours of sleep without showing impairment, but this is such a small portion that it's more than likely not you. So at least seven hours is really what you should be striving for. And while there is that small subsection of the population that can get by on less than seven hours, five hours is really the cutoff for everyone where effectively nobody can get by on less than five hours of sleep without showing impairment. And Matt Walker has a tremendous quote for this. He says that the number of people that can get by on five hours of sleep or less expressed as a percent of the population and rounded to a whole number is zero. This is a really powerful quote and is essentially saying that the overwhelming majority of the population need at least seven hours of sleep. There may be a small subsection that can get by on less than seven hours of sleep and effectively no one can get five or less without showing any impairment. But again, most of us should be striving for at least seven hours. Tip number three relates to light exposure. And generally we wanna get a lot of light exposure in the morning, preferably sunlight if possible, and very little light exposure in the evening. So light exposure in the morning will help promote wakefulness and alertness throughout the day and then less light exposure in the evening will help promote sleep. Light is also a very powerful force that helps to set our circadian clocks. So in regard to setting your circadian rhythm up for success, light exposure in that early light exposure in the morning and then little light exposure at night is the best way to go about this. One note specifically on this is that blue light tends to particularly be detrimental for our sleep. And what appears to be happening here is that it inhibits our natural melatonin release, which then makes it more difficult to fall asleep and to stay asleep. So in the evening, try to close out your laptop and put your phone away. There are certain applications and settings in your phone that allow you to move the light spectrum further away from the blue and more toward the warm side of things. But generally, I think the best policy here is just to try to get away from the light altogether. You can also use blue light blocking glasses. I actually had a pair of those for a little while, but I really wasn't wearing them that much. I found them to be kind of annoying because I don't wear glasses on a regular basis. So I just stopped wearing them and adjusted the light settings on my phone and computer, and that seems to work pretty well. But again, I think the best policy here is just to try to get away from the screens altogether in the evening time. Tip number four relates to temperature in your sleeping environment. And so this generally needs to be quite a bit cooler than most people think. The optimal range tends to be from 65 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit and this is just the range you can kind of play around with it to see what works best for you but the reason that it needs to be so cold is that the core body temperature needs to drop two to three degrees Fahrenheit to initiate sleep not only will this help you fall asleep but this will also help you stay asleep so for better sleep keep it cool. Tip number five is don't eat too close to bedtime. And the reason that we don't want to do this is that eating will raise our core body temperature. And we just learned that we need to drop our core body temperature to fall asleep and to stay asleep. Another thing that can happen here is that eating too close to bedtime, especially larger meals can increase the likelihood for indigestion, which will subsequently negatively impact your sleep. So the general rule here is to try to stop eating anywhere from two to three hours before bedtime. Tip number six is to exercise, but not too close to bedtime, similar to 
eating. If you do it too close to bedtime, it can raise your core body temperature, making it more difficult to fall asleep and to stay asleep. So generally I would recommend exercising in the morning or afternoon if you can, and this will help set you up for more optimal temperatures to help you fall asleep and stay asleep. A quick note on the last two tips, so don't eat and don't exercise too close to bedtime. And I wanted to sort of offer a little empathy here because these are ones that I tend to struggle with personally. I like to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, for example, and those classes that I can actually attend tend to be at night anywhere from six to seven or seven to eight. And then I would come home and eat afterwards, which is obviously pushing it a little closer to bedtime than I would prefer. So again, I'm not perfect on these either. I realize that your life circumstances and schedule won't always facilitate this sort of optimal sleep setup. But again, I just wanna give you the information. The next three tips, as Matt Walker says, are likely to make me deeply unpopular. And with that said, tip number seven is moderate your caffeine intake. And so before there's an uprising, I wanna go ahead and get out in front of this and say that I love my coffee. I'm a big coffee drinker, but having this knowledge on how caffeine works in the body has been incredibly helpful for me, and I think it will be for you as well. Caffeine is very effective at impairing the quality of your sleep, and this is true regardless of whether or not you actually feel it. So you or some people you know may say that you can drink a cup of coffee right before bed and fall asleep without any issue. The trouble here is that even if you're able to fall asleep, caffeine is negatively impacting the quality of your sleep, and this can be objectively shown in the sleep lab. In regard to the degree of impairment that caffeine has on your sleep, Dr. Walker likes to say that he would have to age you by a decade in order to show equivalent impairment compared to the same person without caffeine in their system while sleeping. One of the biggest things about caffeine that people don't tend to realize is its relatively long half-life, and what a half-life is essentially is the amount of time required for the body to clear out half of something. So caffeine has a half-life of about five to six hours, and this makes the quarter life 10 to 12 hours. So for example, if you had a cup of coffee, let's just say 100 milligrams to make the math easy. If you had 100 milligrams of caffeine at 2 p.m. at 8 p.m., potentially half of that or 50 milligrams is still circulating. And at 2 a.m., a quarter of that or 25 milligrams is still circulating. This is unlikely to give you a good night's sleep. So the general recommendation here is to try to cut off caffeine intake around noon. You know, again, earlier is probably better here, but I realize that we also have to live our lives. Tip number eight is to be mindful of your alcohol intake. And so alcohol, while generally thought of as a sleep aid, is actually anything but. It is very effective at suppressing your REM sleep. This is your rapid eye movement sleep or your dream sleep. And this is crucial for many physiological processes, but one of which is emotional well-being. Alcohol will also fragment your sleep such that you are waking up more throughout the night. And this is true whether you know it or not. So we can call some of these awakenings may be a micro awakening such that you don't necessarily remember it the next day. You may wake up, fall back asleep in a second without even thinking about it, and then the next morning you won't even recall having woken up. But this does still have a negative impact on your sleep quantity and quality. Again, I'm not trying to take all the fun out of life here, but I want to give you the information. So for a better night's sleep, try to avoid alcohol as you get close to bedtime. Tip number nine relates to marijuana intake, and I don't personally use this, but I still wanted to bring it up because I realized that it's a hot topic and a lot of people do use it. Additionally, it's very frequently and incorrectly thought of as a sleep aid. So very similar to alcohol, marijuana is also very effective at suppressing your REM sleep, your dream sleep, and this again is despite generally being thought of as a sleep aid. It is anything but. So with this you may know others or yourself who may say something along the lines of, well it helps me fall asleep, and this is similar to alcohol in that marijuana and alcohol may actually help you fall asleep faster, but again once you're asleep it is negatively impacting the quality of your sleep by suppressing your REM sleep. And this brings up a good point in that generally our subjective self-evaluation does not necessarily necessarily correlate to objective measurements. Even though you might perceive it to be helping objectively in the lab, we could show that it is actually harmful. Tip number 10 relates to other sleep aids, and I give the scare quotes because generally these medications, whether over the counter or prescribed, are not all that they're cracked up to be. Matthew Walker was on a podcast called The Drive with Peter Atia, and in this they discussed sleep aids, where Matt Walker essentially said that sleep aids don't promote natural sleep, and Peter Atia had a tremendous way of describing this, so he compared it to a chemical baseball bat. 
He said that I could swing a bat, hit you in the head, and render you unconscious, but I don't think anyone would argue that that is natural sleep, and it is unlikely that you are going to wake up and feel more rested. And this is essentially what you're doing when you're taking many of these sleep medications. Obviously, there are some medical conditions and life circumstances that may necessitate at least short-term use of some of these medications, but it's probably still good to be aware of this information. Ultimately, before starting or stopping any medication, you need to consult your primary care physician. To piggyback on the sleep aid conversation, I wanted to bring up melatonin and supplementation. So melatonin is a popular compound that is commonly used to supplement sleep, and it may in fact show very minimal usefulness in jet lag scenarios where you're traveling across time zones, but outside of this, it's probably not doing much for you outside of the placebo effect. However, if you do choose to supplement with melatonin, you should be aware of the recommended dose, and it's generally much lower than what you will find in stores. So generally, if you do supplement with melatonin, two to three milligrams is the recommendation. And in stores, you might find five or 10 milligrams, and this is really more than you need, so just be mindful of that. All in all, there really aren't any great medications or supplements out there to help improve your sleep. Really, what we should be trying to focus on is building good habits. And that's 10 tips to help improve your sleep. So I actually do have a bonus tip, and there are no rules here, so we're gonna throw an 11th one in there because I wanna talk about it. And tip number 11 is to relax. So generally, despite what our expectations may be, unrealistically, we can't typically go from the hustle and bustle of a busy day to laying in bed and falling asleep at the snap of our fingers. So we need to set aside some time to unwind before bed. So as bedtime approaches, stop working, log out of your email, close your laptop, put your phone away and do whatever it is that helps you unwind for the day. This could be reading a book, taking a bath, whatever your preference, just slow things down a little bit and relax. Getting into a routine like this will help prime you for a better and more restful night's sleep. And that concludes today's video. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, please go ahead and subscribe to the channel and hit that bell to receive notifications for future videos. Thank you again for all of your time. Have a great day and most of all, sleep well.